All right, guys, we are officially live and kicking off this, uh, this great topic, this great conversation, and this great training that we're going to be diving into today. And that is really how to boost your traffic using what we call the SEO flywheel, where it's taking what we know works, what Etsy wants. So this way here, we can give them what they want. So they give us what we want, and that is traffic and sales. So that's what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, here's what I'd like to do though, because this is a live stream and we are going to be uh, simulcasting here on a few different channels, one of them being Everbee. And I want to thank Everbee for inviting us on their channel once again and doing this exclusive training for them. We're also uh, streaming on my channel over at Rock Your Brand. So I want to thank you guys for tuning in as well. And we're also on Facebook. So guys, I just want to thank you guys for showing up. And if you guys have any questions during this training, I want you to drop it in the comments below. This is going to be interactive. We will be taking some questions um, after we go through this training. And I'd also like to know where you guys are tuning in from. So if you guys could do that in the comments, let us know where you're tuning in from and what you're most excited to learn from this training. That would be absolutely amazing. And uh, well, Chris Schaefer is going to be presenting and really going through this training because, well, he's the guy that I always lean on when it is about SEO, search engine optimization, and that, that could be on Google, that could be on Etsy, it could be on Amazon, doesn't really matter because SEO really does work very similar on all these different search platforms, and Chris is a wizard at that. Yes, Chris, I did say that, you're a wizard. At uh, at this SEO game, up. Uh, you know what Chris isn't good at is turning his mic on so we can all hear. Yeah, him. I'm trying to be nice and making sure that nobody has to listen to me clickety clack on the keyboard over here. <laughs> so not only so I I graduated from like nerd or I think you called me at one point an SEO dork uh, from a a dork to a wizard. So that is that is a promotion I will take. And Scott, I think anytime you're talking about algorithms, people have some assumptions. And I have a slide that I I I very much. Uh, got a kick out of and I hope everybody does as well but everybody likes to think of these things as like something that's against them and realistically if we start thinking about algorithms and whether it's Google Etsy Amazon right whatever the platform is that we're trying to optimize for what is the outcome that that person wants right in the case of something like Google when you run a Google search the outcome that Google wants the outcome that Google rewards is that you fully answer that person's question in the case of somebody like Etsy or Amazon, the outcome that Etsy or Amazon wants is that you lead that person to the ultimate product that they will buy, right? The, the perfect world for Etsy is that somebody runs a search on Etsy, they click on one listing, they buy it right away. And if we can approach it from that perspective, right? Stop trying to fight the algorithm or trick the algorithm and give people what they want because all algorithms really are at the end of the day are trying to approximate what people want if that makes sense. Yep. Uh, if we can do that and we can focus on that, then we will start to get rewarded for doing what people want, which is showing them the product that they're going to buy eventually. And yep. so if we start thinking about it that way, then it starts to make this a little bit easier. We're going to go in, we're going to break down how the flywheel works. We're going to talk a little bit about the algorithm and how scary that can sound and how really not scary at all it is. It's actually fairly straightforward and it makes a lot of sense when you spend a couple minutes thinking about it from that perspective. Um, and then we're gonna give you guys some tips on how to create your listings or how to optimize your listings once they've been created and you have a little bit of the data coming through so you can really take advantage of the flywheel. Yeah, the one thing I did wanna say here, guys, is like there are some things that we're gonna be sharing with you that if you implement these, these will help you. These will help you get more traffic, they'll help you get more sales, and you're gonna soon find out that when you put this together, it is the ultimate flywheel. And that's why we're calling it the Etsy SEO traffic flywheel because everything kind of feeds into itself. But there is one specific thing, one very specific thing that if you don't have this piece, it's not gonna work no matter what you do. Uh, and Chris is gonna actually dig into that. That'll be one of the first things we discuss because if we don't have this, nothing else is going to matter. And it's really, really important that you understand that. So before we officially kick off, we got a bunch of people rolling in from all over the globe. I see I see, we got England, someone from England tuning in, which is amazing. And uh, just people from all over the United States as well. So thank you guys so much for showing up. 
And if you have any questions, drop them in the comments. One thing I want you to do right now, though, is in the comments, let us know, can you hear us and see us? Okay. So this way here, we know that uh, we are streaming, but we're also going to be recording this. So you guys can go back to it, watch it on the replay. All right. And then we're going to go ahead and get rocking and rolling. I just saw Myrtle Beach come in here from South Carolina. We spent some time in Myrtle Beach doing some tournaments, beach volleyball. My daughter's in beach volleyball. So uh, yeah, been there quite a few times in the last three years. Um, all right, cool. I see a lot of yeses. So Chris, we are officially ready to kick this off. So with that being said, Chris, why don't you take it away and uh, explain to us what this Etsy uh, or this Etsy SEO flywheel is really all about. It's a tongue twister, as you can see. So, Chris, kick it off, buddy. I, I'm just laughing, Scott, because I made uh, made that verbal slip up when I was talking to you earlier this morning. I called it the Etsy flywheel. And I think that is appropriate, right? Because it is the SEO flywheel for Etsy. So, Scott, before we jump into this, what is a flywheel? Like what? What is the concept behind this? Why are we using that word? If people haven't heard that terminology, what is it and why is it important to understand? Well, I think it's really important to understand because and we're going to show you guys a graph here, not even a graph, a diagram. We've got some graphs too, but we're going to show you a diagram of how it really looks because I think once you visualize it, you'll understand it. But to me, what a flywheel is, is it something that might take a little bit of work to get going, right? It's like something starts to, to spin and something starts to take off. And as it keeps going and as it keeps getting pushed a little bit, it's going to get a little bit faster and a little bit faster and a little bit faster. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to keep going fast. It just means that it has to keep moving and it's going to keep going and working and really feeding the flywheel to keep that momentum going, to keep it steady. And that's really what we're talking about here is taking these elements and the important ones are the foundational pieces, which you're going to see here, but then really what activates and what makes the flywheel go in motion. So that's really what we're talking about here. Yeah, I think the, the other analogy that we could use for this is kind of a snowball, right? It's a perpetual motion snowball. And so realistically, what we're looking for is not just making sure that we have keywords and stuff in there, but how can we take advantage of the way that Etsy SEO or Etsyo works to make sure that we don't just rank now, but we rank down the road. And that's really what we're looking for here. The common misconception, Scott, and I'm sure you've heard the, the term like perpetual motion machine, right? Like something you can set up once and it produces energy or motion forever. That's kind of what we're after with this. And it is, it, it, it's not that you set it up once, but there is ways to keep this on track and keep this moving. And that's why we use, rather than like motion, we use a flywheel or the snowball effect. So what is the Etsy SEO flywheel? Well, it looks a little bit like this. The, the only thing that anybody ever really talks about in terms of Etsy SEO are what we see along the left-hand side, at least my left, right? This column of light blue things. They talk a little bit about product demand. They talk about having keywords in your title. They talk about having some decent images and they talk about descriptions and tags. Those are the things that get you initially noticed by Etsy, but that is not the thing that drives sales over the long term. What does drive sales over the long term? Traffic and sales, more specifically sales, but obviously to get sales, we have to get traffic. So the, the other side of this, where we see the green and the yellow, this starts to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's why we use the flywheel analogy. The more traffic and sales that we can get from having the right demand, the right title, the right images, the right description, and the right tags, the more sales we get, and then the more reviews we get, the higher our rank becomes which then leads us to getting more traffic, which then leads us to getting more sales and reviews. And it becomes a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So this is what we're after with any listing that we create on Etsy. But before we can really dive into this, we have to understand kind of what the algorithm is and what the algorithm isn't. So before we even dive into that, I wanted to talk about what is an algorithm, right? And everybody has this misconception that the algorithm is their enemy. The algorithm is Terminator. It's this robot that's out to destroy your listings and help everybody else except for you, right? In this case, it's a Decepticon. It's coming after you, right? If you guys aren't nerdy enough, that's one of the, the bad guys in the Transformers. Uh, but realistically, if you're approaching this from the flywheel perspective, if you're approaching this from the you want to be friends with the algorithm perspective, it's much more Wally and much less evil, bad, scary robot with a lot of guns. Right. Like that's realistically what we're after. And that's the algorithm is there to be helpful. 
right? Wally was designed to help clean up Earth and make it habitable for humans. The Etsy algorithm is designed to clean up the Etsy search results and make it habitable for people who want to buy stuff. And if we think about it that way, and we think about Wally being our friend, right? The Etsy SEO algorithm really is our friend if we start to understand it. Rather than treating it as the enemy, this becomes a lot easier. We don't need to trick it. We don't need to do anything. We just need to give it what it's looking for. And in the case of the Etsy SEO algorithm, realistically, it breaks down into two different things. And you'll hear people say Etsy has multiple algorithms, right? But they work together as one big thing. The first thing that Etsy is trying to do is they're trying to make sure that your product matches what somebody is searching for. That's what they refer to as query matching, right? So if somebody types in fishing hat, if you have fishing hat somewhere in your listing, that kind of gets you past step one, right? And we'll talk about this here in a little bit. The second half is Etsy rank, and that's going to be how likely your product is to lead to a positive interaction with the customer, right? Somebody clicking on it, somebody interacting with it, somebody adding it to their cart, hopefully someone buying it. And if we think about those two different things as we're creating our listing, it starts to make a lot of sense. So like I said a minute ago, query matching is essentially binary. It's yes or no. Etsy is swiping left or right on your product, and they're saying it matches or it doesn't match. That's pretty much it. If the keyword isn't related to something that's in your listing, and it doesn't have to be there, right? It could be a plural or a misspelling, but it has to be related to something that's in your titles, tags, descriptions. If you don't qualify for that, you don't match at all, and they don't go on to step two. If you do qualify for that, then they move on to Etsy rank, which is essentially four big buckets, right? It's kind of three, and then one floats in and out. The first thing that they're then looking at and in terms of importance is what they refer to as the listing quality score. This is the core of the Etsy rank algorithm. Essentially, if someone comes to your listing, how likely are they to buy? If they don't buy, do they add it to the cart? If they don't add it to the cart, do they favorite it? Or on the negative side of this, do they come to your listing, realize that it's not what they want and bounce back to the Etsy search results to go to somebody else's product, right? That's the listing quality score. The second side of this, and it's a it's a smaller factor than the individual listing score, is your shop score. And this is essentially how likely your listings in general are to sell, how well you've done historically compared to the other people that pass that yes or no swipe test of the query matching. And then to offset that, because there are new listings, Etsy uses the recency factor. And you may have heard people, especially Scott and myself, refer to this as the Etsy boost, right? When you first create a new listing, they try to get you in front of people so that they can understand your listing quality score and what that would be once someone comes to your listing. If they don't have data on whether or not someone is willing to buy your product because zero people have ever seen it because you created it this morning, then they use that recency factor to help balance out the search results and give new listings additional chances to rank. The last thing and the only one that we don't really have any control over is previous shopper behavior. So if someone runs a search and you've bought a lot of bass fishing stuff, your search results are going to look a little bit different than mine. But the biggest two factors that we need to think about here are the listing quality score and the shop score. So how do all of our listings do overall? And how is this listing doing compared to the other listings that pass that match test? Does that make sense, Scott? And uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, so it, it makes sense. Here's the thing, guys. What Chris is going over right now are these fundamental pieces that we need to understand, right? If we understand that, then we can start to build out the pieces, which we're going to talk about here in great detail here coming up very, very soon. Um, the very first thing that we're going to be talking about is one of the most important things. But without understanding how Etsy is really treating what we are doing and what we are creating, we don't really understand it. So we can't really give it what, what it wants. We're going to give you the things to give them here in a second, but it's really, it's really important to understand what they are looking for. And all of the pieces that Chris just covered are the things that they're looking for. And really thinking about this, and this is what I want you guys to think about, always be thinking about. You are creating a title. You are creating images. You are creating descriptions for humans not necessarily for Etsy search algorithm, right? That's the thing that I think people are always trying to think like, what is the, what is the hack? What is the, what is the secret way to find those keywords that I get there and no one else can? And like, what's all of this, you know, magic stuff that I can do and the wizardry as, as uh, you know, Chris would put it right. Like 
That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about understanding what the algorithm is doing. And it's really serving up the best result for the person doing the search. And I think that's it in a nutshell. So Chris, yeah, I love it. It, it really is. And that's what they're looking for because the goal of Etsy's search bar or however you're searching on Etsy mm -hmm. is to show every individual user the product they are going to purchase when they run that search, right? Yep. Etsy loves your 20 cent listing fees, but what they really love are their transaction fees and their yeah. commissions on the sales, right? And so their goal is to sell products and connect the right product to the right person. So if we think about giving Etsy what they want, right? We pass that first test, that Tinder swipe test, right? They're saying yes or no. Once they've said yes, then it's basically how likely is your product to sell based on the previous behavior of that user, which is a, a smaller factor, and the, the overall behavior of what happens when they send a user to your listing and everyone else's listing who passes that test. Right. And so if that's the way that we think about this, it becomes a little bit easier. The yep. biggest thing that we can have an effect on here is the listing quality score. But before we dive into that, we need to start talking about how to actually pass the first half of that test. Right. We need to get them to swipe yes on us. And that is this yellow section we, or the sorry, the light blue section we talked about a little bit earlier. This is going to be understanding one, that there's people looking for the products and then yeah. trying to create a listing that calls their attention and is going to let Etsy know that our product is relevant to what the person is typing in. And so the very first thing that we need to do when we're creating a product is we need to find the in-demand keywords. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do this. One of my favorite ways to do this is just using the keyword tool that's built right into Everbee, right? It fills in the auto-suggest with what the assumed monthly searches are for every particular thing. In this case, we can see if I'm typing in phishing, that phishing hat gets a few hundred monthly searches. Now, this volume is not going to be like spot on and every month's going to be a little bit different, but this lets us know that a phishing hat gets more searches than a phishing PNG. So if we're trying to determine, you know, if we're going to launch a hat or a digital download first, this can help us in that determination. The next thing that we're going to do is we're actually going to go to the search results because now that we have a little bit of an understanding of what people are typing in, right? So I have a phishing hat. Cool. I can just use the term phishing hat. Now I'm actually going to go look at the search results and I'm going to analyze them. The very first step that we always do when we're doing this is we just use the analysis tool from Everbee. So we go to the search results, you click on the analysis tool. And what this allows us to then do is sort by monthly revenue, because what we want to find out is not just what is this keyword that's potentially biased based on what I typed into the auto suggest, but of all of the people who Etsy says are relevant for that particular keyword, who are the top sellers? across all of the different variations of that. Because I think everybody listening understands that fishing hat is only one thing that somebody could be typing in. They could be typing in bass fishing hat, trout fishing hat, right? They could be typing in afternoon fishing hat, dad fishing hat, a whole bunch of different variations of this. And the auto suggest results that we get are only going to show us what we are typing in. What we find out when we start to do the analysis of the top sellers is we understand what they are using and what they are relevant for that we might not have otherwise thought of. Does that make sense, Scott? Yeah. Yeah. I, I really, really want people to understand right now <clears throat> that finding the keywords for top sellers is super important. But what Chris is doing here is he's also looking at not just the top keywords, the ones that are generating sales. And I think that's the important piece here is we're looking at demand. So if you guys are taking notes, this is like a huge part in really being successful is looking at the demand because you can go and optimize. You can do everything that we're going to share with you here today. You can do everything, you know, dot all the I's, cross all the T's, you can do everything, but it's not going to matter if no one is searching for the items right now. So that's why we need to do this research. That's why we're using the tool ever be because they're allowing us to look at this data and make good decisions and see where our time is best spent. All right. So this one here, I don't want to gloss over this. I want you to really, really understand this because we can do all the other stuff. It's not going to matter unless we really validate that there's demand right now. And there might be demand in fourth quarter. But we need to look right now or, you know, this time of year, because believe it or not, guys, like there is seasonality or there is fourth quarter businesses and that's when they do most of their business. So we want to make sure that we're optimizing for keywords that are relevant, but also that are in demand. 
So yes, I just wanted to, to highlight that, Chris. I think it's really, really important where you're going here. I think the, the biggest thing that people get out of this step that they don't by using just a keyword research tool, Scott, is you understand not just what's working for the particular keyword that you typed in, but for every keyword variation that Etsy says you are relevant for, right? If, yeah. if we type fishing hat into our listing somewhere, titles, tags, descriptions, wherever, Mm -hmm. They know that we're relevant for that, but they also know that we're relevant for fishing hats, bass fishing hat, dad fishing hat, afternoon fishing hat, all of these variations. And by sorting by monthly revenue, what we are then able to see is not just the biased version of what we typed in, right? Because Etsy's going to say, well, maybe uh, you're not the most relevant for fishing hat. And so this, this top listing might rank, you know, ninth for fishing hat, but they might rank first for bass fishing hat. And we need to know what is the actual keyword that's driving the sales for this product. We have to think about this holistically. And by sorting this by revenue, we can say, okay, for everything that Etsy has swiped right on to say, yes, it's relevant when they type in fishing hat, this is the top selling product for all of the different variations that could have gotten us to that point, right? And so if we use that as our basis, we can then start to understand not just what worked for the, the particular keyword that we typed in, but that works for that. I, I don't want to call it a niche, right? But like yeah. that general product, right? So the idea of a fishing hat, all of the different ways that people could get there. We now can take this a level deeper rather than just relying on the auto suggest from Etsy. We can look at what's working and what's not. And so Chris, if we before you in, move on, before you move on, um, there's some questions coming in and guys, we are going to get to them. I promise you. So save the question. Don't even save them. Put the questions in there, but we'll go ahead and save them. And then from there, we'll go ahead and address them. And there's some some uh, really, really great questions coming in on keywords and uh, and even on like, uh, you know, during the ads or when you're running ads, like all of those things. We're going to we're going to address them. So just make sure that you put your uh, your questions in the comments. And then also let us know so far if you're getting value from this. And if you are, give us a little love, smash that like button and uh, let other people know about it if they are in fact, selling on Etsy. So we would really appreciate that. So Chris, keep going, man. But before we dive into the rest of this, Scott, we did get one question that I want to address right now. So somebody okay. had said, uh, the top one is an ad. Should that be considered? The I'm answer sorry? is no. So the, the top search result in the screenshot that we're showing is an ad. And they want to know, should we just throw that one out? And the answer is no, because Etsy still sees that as relevant to this search. And I don't care if 100% of their sales are coming from ads. I still need to see what they're doing. Yeah. Because whatever yeah. they're doing in their listing means they are relevant for this. You, if, if they were running a fishing hat ad and they were trying to show up for computer chips, right? Even setting a hundred dollar bid, they probably wouldn't show up for that because Etsy doesn't see them as relevant. Etsy does see them as relevant. So at this stage, right? And we'll talk about where to kind of throw this data around and you'll see some problems with this listing later on. But at this stage, all we are looking for is who is selling the most and what are they doing? right? Yeah. If, even if they're not ranking first, what are they doing to get those sales and how are they relevant to this listing or to this search? That's what we need to know at this point. So we'll take a look at like the difference between some of these listings here in a minute. But the first step in this process is just trying to figure out what keywords they are using and the keywords that everyone else is using. Yeah. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think people should look at like, if people are running ads and you're able to see that, it actually helps you see if there's demand, right? Without you spending the money. So actually they're doing you a favor by running ads and being able to then at least look at the data. Cause like Chris said, it doesn't matter if you're running ads or if you're organically getting found sales or sales, and that's going to allow us to know if there's demand for this product. So that's a huge takeaway. And I'm glad you brought that up, Chris. All right, let's move on. Uh, there we go. All right. So once we've sorted this way, we have to actually jump in and look at the listings. And this is where, that's why I brought up that ads question, because this is not a great listing, even though they are the top sellers. And we'll dive into all of the reasons here in a minute, but I wanted to showcase this one because they are selling more than anybody else that is trying to sell a fishing hat every single month. And they don't even have it in the title of the listing, right? But the reason that Etsy sees them as relevant, and this is something, Scott, that gets brought up all the time. Well, if it's just in my tags and it's not in my title, I can never rank for it. You can, right? Because if we look at this, the title for this is Women Want Me, Fish Fear Me. Nothing about hats, nothing about anything like that. Yes, the word 
fish is in the title, but fishing hat isn't there. Hat isn't even in the title. So when we then look at the tags of this, we can see fly fishing. Okay, that makes sense, right? It's relevant to the fly fishing niche. So I'm going to add that as a tag. Fishing hat, dad hat, hat, cap, Father's Day, dads, right? All of these kinds of things are going to be things that we want to include in our listing. What we're going to then do is we're going to come back here and I'm going to typically suggest that we go through the top three to five. If you have the time, go through all five and just write down a list of all of the related keywords and tags that you see. So all you have to do to do this is just click on the, the product name if you're using Everbee and it'll take you into this, uh, this other view. It's actually stacked uh, on top of each other, but since slides are horizontal, I broke it up. <laughs> but you can see this, you can do this very quickly. Jot down the keywords that you see in their title, jot down the tags that they are using, and this will then help you when you move into the actual creation phase. So the question you need to ask yourself if you're creating or editing your listing is at this point, are you using the main keywords that you see the top sellers using in their titles and tags? Are the biggest keywords that you see in those three to five top selling listings, are they in the front or in your title? If not, see if you can put them there. If it doesn't make sense, then add it to the tags, right? One thing that Etsy has said, if you go through all of their documentation, and I would not suggest that you do it unless you really love learning everything there is to know about algorithms and like watching your eyes bleed Indiana Jones style, uh, is that they do give a little bit more weight to the first part of the title, right? So it's not that all the keywords in your title have different weight, but they do give a little bit more weight to the first few characters of that title. So if you see fishing hat over and over and over again as something that people are using, put that towards the front of the title because that is after all what you are selling, right? It's the name of the product that also makes sense. And if we're thinking about this from a human perspective, when we type in fishing hat and the very first word that we see when we look at the listing is fishing hat, you go, hey, that's what I'm looking for, which then gets us into the, the second half of the SEO algorithm, right? The second thing that I want everybody to keep in mind is that if you don't have a main keyword space in your title, or there's a bunch of supporting keywords, like in this case, uh, dad hat, probably not relevant to the main title, but it's definitely something that looks like it's getting a lot of searches. It looks like something like a lot of people are going to give this to their dad for Father's Day, which is probably why Father's Day is one of their tags, right? We're going to add all of those extra things into tags. One of the biggest mistake that I see Etsy sellers making is that they don't take full advantages of the tags because they read or they heard somewhere that tags don't do anything. Well, if we go back to this listing, making almost $2,000 a month in revenue, this is proof. And this is one of the reasons, Scott, that I wanted to use this as an example. This is proof that tags work. There's nothing else in this listing other than the tags that make this listing relevant in any way for the search that we ran. But Etsy swiped right on this and they said, yes, this is relevant. And it just happens to have a fish on it, right? And the reason that they did that is because fly fishing, fishing hat, fly fishing, caps, hat, all of those things are in the tags for this listing, which is what helps Etsy understand that this is potentially relevant. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. Uh, he, here's here's the, the thing, guys. Like, so what Chris is sharing with you is like, okay, do tags actually make a difference? And here's one way that we know that they do. Number one, Etsy has said in their documentation that they do look at tags. We're being able to validate this ourselves, and we've done this ourselves, by looking at your Etsy ads data. That's why if you're not running Etsy ads, just to get the data is actually worth it. Because now, yes, and someone had asked in the comments, can I use Everbee on my own listing to see my own SEO? And the answer is, yeah, you can go ahead and put all your tags in there and then it'll pull back all your tags and show you what you're, you know, what you are actually being indexed for because it's all part of your listing. But another way of doing this and to really see, okay, like what is, uh, you know, what is, uh, you know, Etsy using to basically help people find my listing and am I indexed for this stuff? Because there's something different here be between being, uh, you know, being optimized, thinking you're optimized and actually then knowing you're optimized because then you can have Etsy validate that you are in fact optimized. And how you do this is when you run ads, you can literally see, it'll tell you all of the keywords that people are searching for that are leading to your product through that ad. And it'll say in there where the, where the keyword was picked up. It's either picked up in the title or it was picked up in a tag. And it literally says tag. So if you don't think that tags are important, they are important. 
Now, are they the biggest factor? Probably not, but it is a factor. Um, so I'm glad that you brought that up, Chris. That's uh, that's really, really good. And I love it. Yeah. And realistically, right, having and making that first half of the algorithm happy comes down to these two things, right? Are we using all of the relevant keywords that we see the top sellers using or anything else that we think is relevant to this? Are we using them in our title or tags, right? If you think about it that way, potentially the description as well, and we'll get to that here, here in a couple minutes, right? But if, if it's included somewhere in the text of the listing, Etsy is then going to swipe right on that listing and say, all right, this qualifies as relevant for the search that that person is putting in. Let's move on to step two, right? The other thing I want people to consider here is images. Now, this isn't as relevant to the first step of this process, but since we're in the listing analysis phase, this is realistically where we're going to be looking at these things because we're looking at all of the competition. So if we're creating or editing a listing, the next thing that we need to be looking at are the images. And we need to understand what kinds of images the top sellers are using so that we can replicate that style. Obviously, we're not going to copy the exact image because our product is going to be different. But what are the things that they are doing with the images? Are they showing just one style? Are they showing off the different features of the product in their additional images? And more importantly, and we'll touch on this again here in a minute, are they using video? Are they doing anything other than just one photo and going from there? Does that make sense, Scott? Yeah. The one thing, I mean, we're going to dig into this more, but... Images play a vital role in a lot of different aspects. Uh, and the ones that we know that it will impact is it will definitely impact your clicks, right? So a good image is going to get you a click. What does a click do? It gets someone to your listing. And then from there, we have another chance of someone potentially buying from us. Now, we don't know this to be fact, but I would probably say that in the algorithm, it is going to reward you for having a fully built out and optimized listing. And what I mean by that is you are having your images being used. And I know, Chris, you're going to go into this a little bit, but if you look at the slot on the left-hand side or the slots, I should say, all of those images are filled out, even if it's just different angles, right? Or different views, right? And you can see there, they have a few different colors and they have it, you know, I'm maybe on a different, uh, on a different piece of wood because now it's being, you know, shown differently. It's picking up a certain color. And then you can notice there's a video in there and the video is just a video of them video in the camera or the, uh, the hat just kind of roaming around. So the image placements are really, really important for a lot of different reasons. And this is where I see people rush and they, um, they don't take enough time to put into their images. And these images are critical for you to be able to get not just traffic, but to get sales, which again, feeds into that flywheel that we talked about earlier. Yeah. And again, like the images are not going to affect whether you are relevant or not. It's going right. to affect the second half of the algorithm, right? So if Etsy shows that you are relevant, they say, yep, they're relevant. And then they show your listing. This is one of the big areas that you need to be paying attention to. And so since we're doing the competitive analysis to figure out the title, tags, and description, this is the time to really take to heart what they are doing with the images. And what we're looking for here is why people are more attracted to the top sellers, right? Obviously, to get a sale, someone has to click on the listing. And there's only a few things that play into whether or not they're going to click on the listing. And those are the things that they see on the, the search results page, right? Which is going to be number one, the title, number two, that thumbnail image, which in a lot of cases now is becoming a video if you're filling that out. And if you're not doing that and you have that option, make sure that you're doing that, even if it's just something as silly as going into Canva and creating a GIF, because that's going to attract more attention. And what we're really looking for here is trying to get as much attention as possible. But what we're doing is we're taking those, again, top three to five listings and we're saying, okay, both of these are priced at $22, so it's not the price. What is the reason that somebody would be clicking on one more or the other? What is, you know, what's the, the, the hook to make a terrible fishing pun here, right? What are the things that they're doing? In this case, almost every listing is doing a front on shot. Some are better than others, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. A front on shot of the hat or cap with the full design visible. Makes sense because you want people coming to the listing to know what they're clicking on and having that be the same thing that they're going to get. So what we're really looking for here is the style of photo and the kind of images that they're using as the supporting images so that when we create or edit our listing, we can be set up so that when Etsy starts to give us a little bit of traffic love and a little bit of that flywheel starts to go, that we don't have to worry about that. Does that make sense, Scott? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, a- absolutely. I mean, we're going to be using this data. And again, Everbee gives us this data. We can look at all of this stuff and then we can make better decisions to make it better. Um, so yeah, I love it. Yeah, so when we're adding or changing images to our listing, there's three things that we need to be paying attention to. And we've, we've touched on these in one form or another. What kind of images, what angles are they using? Are you completely using all of the image slots? If not, you should be. And the reason for that, Scott, and this is something a lot of people miss in the e-commerce world is you cannot pick up that hat, turn it around and look at it. You can't see the inside of it. It's a picture online. And if we're not giving people all of that information and somebody wants to know what the inside looks like, then they either have to take the time to message you or more likely they're going to bounce back, look for another hat that shows them what the inside looks like because maybe they're allergic to a certain material or maybe they don't like the what like the vented trucker hats, right? They like more of like a regular baseball cap and they can't tell from the front whether it's a trucker hat or a baseball cap. And so they then have to bounce out of the listing. If we can show off those kinds of things by filling up the additional image slots, then we're going to be good to go when we start to get some traffic. It's also going to help us create that traffic to start with. The last thing, and we we mentioned this, is are you taking advantage of video? If you have the option to upload a video to your listing, do it because Etsy is going to show that in the search results page in a lot of cases, which is a great way of calling attention to our listing. So this is an example of a video, right? And Scott, you mentioned this video just a minute ago. You said essentially yep. what they're doing. They set, you know, they sat the hat down and they just took a video with their camera. That's one way of going about it. If you don't have a video or you don't physically have the product to take a video of one thing that you can do like i mentioned is go into canva and create a gif and if you aren't aware of how to do that canva will walk you through the process but essentially you could take all of these other supporting images and create a short video out of all of those images and then upload that as a video and that's what would show in your thumbnail on the etsy search results yeah, chris so before you move on to that i, I want to underscore something just in case it was missed on that video because it is a video, the other thing that that's going to do, and you did say it, but you, you went over it a little bit. So I want to highlight this really, really important is when people are scrolling, if you have a video in there, you're going to see that movement. You're going to see whatever was happening in the first like three seconds. Right. And what that does, it gets attention. Right. So that's a conversion mechanism for getting someone into the listing. It's a click through. Right. So there's all these different conversion things. We always talk about conversions as a sale. But to me, the click is a conversion. Right. It took someone from scroll to click to in. Right. And then we're one step closer to where we could potentially make that sale. So I didn't want to gloss over that. To do it in Canva is very, very simple. I'll probably end up doing a video at some point on that because I've had a lot of people ask how to do it. You literally can make a little mini slideshow of the different angles that you have and maybe zoom in on it and zoom back, right? Something very, very subtle. Um, and I, I believe you only get about 15 seconds on a video. It's something like that, 10 or 15 seconds. It's not that long. Um, there's no sound either. You can't even use sound. Again, another thing that Etsy does is makes it super easy and it doesn't give you a lot of options. It's like, no sound. Don't worry about audio. Don't worry about music. Don't worry about, you know, uh, narrating it. Nothing. Just all we want is a visual, something with movement. Um, and that's it. So I just wanted to highlight that a little bit. So you guys know that that's another reason, not just because video is cool and people like it and they're going to buy it because they're going to be able to watch it. It's more of also a little bit of a pattern interrupt when someone's scrolling. And yeah, it's a, it's a 15 second limit, but there's also a five second minimum on that, right? So okay. it's a five to 15 second video. If you upload it with audio, like you, you go into Instagram and that's another way of doing it would be making yeah. an Instagram reel. Basically, um, it's going to upload and then it's going to strip that video out. So, or sorry, the audio out and you don't have to, you don't have to worry about it because they don't want that like auto playing in people's ears anyway. So now that we've conquered that first phase, right? We understand the images that set us up for step two here. We've gotten our main keywords in the title description or tags, wherever they make the most sense, right? Etsy's now saying, yes, this listing is relevant. What is it that we need to think about at that point? And it really comes down to two things. And this is what we discussed earlier. They have their whole like Etsy rank score that we talked about. But at the end of the day, it comes down to are people coming to your listing when Etsy decides that you're relevant and shows you in the search results. And then if they come to your listing, are they buying? And so the first thing we have to think about is driving traffic to your listing. And yes, we can use the field of dreams approach and just put up a listing and wait for Etsy to give us that Etsy boost, give us a little bit of, of search love and take three, four, five, six months for them to really understand what our 
our listing quality score is, or we can drive traffic ourselves. And there's a couple ways that we can do this. The, the first would be to run an Etsy promotion, right? The second one would be to turn on ads. And then obviously if we have an external traffic source, like an email list, something like that, we can do that. And once we're driving traffic, we really need to pay attention to maximizing the conversion rate. And I know we've gotten a few people asking us about how to do that. We'll dive into that here in a second. The first step to maximizing this opportunity that Etsy's giving us on the organic side of things is standing out. And anything that we can do to stand out will help us to increase clicks. So Scott, you were talking about that video and it just so happens that the example that the arrow is pointed to did not do this intentionally, right? Has that video. So that's gonna help that listing stand out. This listing is also a star seller, which helps us get more attention because it's a purple badge that none of these other people have on the listing. Now, one of the myths that we hear all the time is that being a star seller will increase your rank. That is not true, but it's also not untrue, right? Etsy says that it doesn't help you directly. There's no one-to-one -one correlation between having the star seller badge and ranking higher. And the reason for that is they don't consider that as part of the algorithm, but having the star seller badge increases the click-through rate, which means Etsy then looks at the data on the back end and says, hey, more people click on this listing and then potentially buy or whatever than the other three listings that are in this view right here. So let's give this one a little bit more love. So anything that we can do to increase clicks works. And that's one of the reasons that we love running Etsy promotions. One, promotions work all the time. Nobody ever wants to miss out on anything, right? And if you tell somebody their Kohl's cash is going to expire, they're running to Kohl's that day, right? If your airline points are going to expire, your Amazon gift card is going to expire. I don't think Amazon gift cards expire, but you guys understand my point here, right? If something is going to expire and it's something you were considering, you're going to jump in and buy it. So running Etsy promotions actually helps us increase traffic. Why? One, it stands out again, just like the star seller thing. And you can see the image here, which is fish want me, women scare me, which I can only imagine, Scott, is a direct response to that other one, which was fish fear me and women want me or whatever that other hat was that we were looking at. That's the top yeah. seller in this, right? Like, guys, if you're going to create a product variation, don't be this obvious with it. Uh, but like, you know, if we look at this one, there's two things that make that listing really stand out beyond the mustard yellow with green. Um, like Green Bay Packers look that they have going on. Yeah. Um, and it's the star seller badge, but they are also running a promotion. And we can see that it has that green strike through with a discount that will help us lead to more clicks, which then gives us the opportunity to get more sales. But the other reason that these things work, Scott, is that once somebody gets into that listing, they also see the countdown at the top of the listing, right? And when you get within a certain amount of time, you also see that countdown on the sales page. So there's the potential here that you have the star seller badge, right? You have this extra green strike through that shows that you're running a promotion, that the, the price is on a discount. And then you have this other green little bubble that tells you that the sale is ending in seven hours. All of these things getting clicks, which lead to more sales, especially with something like the sales deadline here, this not only increases clicks, which gives Etsy all of that love, but it's gonna increase our conversion rate because nobody wants to miss out on the discount when that expires. The other thing that you should be doing to get traffic is running Etsy ads. And I know, Scott, we're going to have a lot of people in the comments that are saying, I haven't made any sales yet. I heard I shouldn't run Etsy ads until I do that. Yep. And in this case, it just so happens that the number one organic ranking is also running ads, right? And so they rank number one for ads and number one for organic. We're not doing this to try to naturally boost our organic ranking. What we're doing this for is to one, understand that we did all the keyword research right in the first phase here, that we're using all of the right keywords that Etsy says that we are relevant for, that the keywords that are in our title tags and descriptions are the ones that are actually bringing in the most traffic, not just based on the estimates that we can see, but on the actual real world results of what happens when we do this. But additionally, Etsy, even if you're getting the Etsy boost as a new listing, will only give you so many chances in that organic listing because their goal is to make sales. So if you're not ranking in the top few listings and you're a new listing, you want to have this position. Most people don't understand, even though it says ad right on it, they don't understand what an ad is and they don't really care. As long as your product is relevant to what they are searching for, they're going to click on it. And that then gives us the opportunity to turn that into a sale. So running Etsy ads in addition to Etsy promotions, especially for new listings, is a great way to start increasing that traffic and starting to get that SEO love. Scott, did you have something you wanted to share on Etsy ads? No, just that I really want to, again, emphasize that 
a lot of people when they're starting, especially they don't want to run ads until they're getting sales or till they have reviews. And I had a question, actually, I just answered it this morning in an email and someone was like, you know, uh, should I start running ads even though I don't have any reviews? And the answer is yes. Number one, you get the data back, like I talked earlier, but also you're still going to get people that will buy. Your conversion rate will be lower, but you'll still get people that will buy. And you'll also start getting traffic, which will then give you data. So to me, Etsy ads, even if it's a small budget, two bucks a day is going to give you data. Um, so I just, I really think that you need to understand that everything we talked about as far as optimization, you know, with your title and your images and your description and all that stuff is great. But if we really want to give Etsy what they want, they want sales, right? So we want to drive traffic to then let all the other stuff we did start to work. And then from there, we will get the organic rank. So just understanding how that all works will allow you to start really being willing to say, you know what? I'm not going to have that Starbucks today that I spend four or $5 on. I'm going to spend that on Etsy ads for seven days. Maybe we can do that. We'll get some data, you know? Yeah. Brent, Brandon said, I, I think people can be silly, but everyone knows what an ad is. When I said, what I said was basically people don't care, right? Yeah. As long as your product is relevant to what they're searching for, they don't care that you paid to be there. And most people don't even notice it. One, it's like this big. It's even smaller on mobile. And two, as long as your product is relevant to what they're looking for, you have as good, if not a better chance of them clicking on it. Why? Because it's the top of the page. It's the same reason Google search results are still filled with ads. If you have the number one ad position, you generally will get more clicks than even the number one organic search result in a Google search result. And Etsy isn't all of that much different. But once we've mastered the traffic side of things, we have some traffic coming in, we have to understand where we fall in the conversion rate spectrum. Remember the second half of this Etsy SEO algorithm, the Etsy rank portion that they're looking at after they've said, yes, you are relevant is how likely is it for your listing to lead to a sale? And we have to understand where we fall so that if Etsy does send us traffic by making us number one, number five, wherever that is in the organic search results, we need to know that we are going to convert that person into a customer. Why? Not because we're trying to please the algorithm, but because we're trying to create the listing that the person is going to buy, right? We want to create the best listing for people. And one of the best ways to figure out where you fall into this hierarchy is to use the newer uh, feature out of Everbee. And this is available on their growth plan, which is the conversion rate factor that they have here. If you open up their product analytics tab and you're looking at the search results, you have to scroll the whole way to the right-hand side. I believe you can, you know, shrink down columns and all of those things if you want to. But you can just scroll to the right-hand side of that and it will give you their conversion rate based on their views and the number of sales that Everbee projects for that listing. What this tells us is if Etsy were to give us traffic, how likely are we to convert versus the other people who rank highly for this term and are already selling? And in this case, we can see that even though the top seller is the top seller, they're only converting at 1%, which going back to the point we were making earlier is probably the reason they're spending so much on ads because they don't rank nearly as well as some of the other people. Why is that? Well, we can see this third one here who is running ads, but they also happen to rank first, uh, is converting around 6% or sorry, they rank second, not first, right? So they're converting at 6% versus 1%. So if you were Etsy, would you rather show the listing that's going to convert one out of a hundred people or six out of a hundred people. The answer obviously is six. Your goal as Etsy is to make sales. And if you send me a hundred people and you send Scott a hundred people, Scott converts six of them. I convert one. Obviously they want to show Scott to as many people as they possibly can. And we can see in the organic search results that the one that's converting at 6% is second. And the one that's converting at 1% is, what is that? It's got seventh <laughs> out of eight in the organic rankings. And the yeah. only reason they're getting a lot of the traffic that they are is because they, they are in the ads. Like every time I hit refresh on this, they showed up in the ads. Every variation of the keyword that I put in for this, they showed up in the ads. Part of that is because they're not as relevant as some of the other people. But the other part of that is that they're not converting nearly as well. Etsy wants to know that. And so what we want to do is not just look at the top sellers, but we want to look at the top converters. Now that we understand the keywords and the phrases that need to be in our title tags and descriptions, the next thing that we want to replicate is who is selling the most when Etsy rewards them with that visit. 
And so what we're looking for is, again, what supporting images are being used? Are they using all of their image slots? Are they showing different things off? If we miss this in the first step, we need to go back and check this. And if our conversion rate is not as high as the other people that are in the top sellers, we need to be looking at what they're doing that we're not. So not just what supporting images are used, but are they using all of them? What angles are they showing? How are they showing off those photos? The second thing that we need to look at is what's the description like? And we'll see an example of this here in a minute. Are we answering all of the potential customers questions that they might have? If not, there's a better chance that they're going to bounce back to the Etsy search results and click on the next product in line to try and buy that. That will lower our conversion rate and help somebody else get the sale, which gives them all of the Etsy love. The last thing that needs to be considered are are you a star seller? Are you running promotions? Are you doing any of those kinds of things to help you stand out? And are the top sellers? In most cases, you're going to see that they have, you know, the, the star seller badge. They have, uh, you know, promotions running, some of those kinds of things. But just keep that in mind because that's going to help bring in more qualified traffic. It's not going to give you a direct SEO boost like we mentioned a little bit ago, but it is going to help you increase overall traffic because more people will click on your listing compared to the people who do not have that type of a badge, whether it be the star seller badge, the best seller badge, yada, 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 yada. Right. So when we're going through this process, the all right, guys, I think we might have lost Chris. Uh, so we're going to have to wait a second here because uh, it looks like he's got his slides and here he comes back. So uh, let's see, Chris, what happened? I hopefully hopefully he didn't lose power like last time. Um, so hang tight, guys. Can you guys still hear and see me OK? Let me know in the comments if you can hear and see me okay. And then uh, I can go ahead and start answering some questions while we wait for Chris to get back. Okay, yes, you can. All right, cool. Can you hear me, Scott? Right. I can hear you. I can't see you, Chris. All right, I'm seeing some yeses for me, no for you. So this is what happens when you do a live stream. Um, <laughs> yeah, technology. All right, no problem. So here's what I'm going to do. While we're waiting for Chris to get back, we were talking on conversions. Um, and let me see if I even can share. Uh, no, I don't have. He has access to the slides. So I can't even do that. Um, but let's do this. Let's answer some questions. And then we will hopefully get Chris back here fairly soon here. So I'm going to go into the questions real quick. Um, Okay, so how can you use Everbee to check SEO sufficiency on your own? So the very first thing that I would do if I was checking my own using uh, Everbee would be just, is it picking up my tags, you know, as far as that goes? And then also, like, there is a tracker in there as well. So I can actually see the keywords that I want to rank for. I can start tracking those to see where I'm ranking um, in the search results. So that's something that you can do. But as far as using Everbee to check the SEO, it's really going to be looking at your tags and looking at your keywords um, that you are using. So that's that's the way that I would use that. But like I said, Everbee for me is a way for me to get the data from other selling products that are similar to mine and be able to utilize that data and apply it to my own. All right. Um, let's see here. Uh, how can we compete with top sellers as beginners? Uh, well, here's the deal. You have to start somewhere. So how you can compete with top sellers is just look and see what they're doing and how can you make yours better? right? So we're not trying to necessarily create the exact same product and the exact same images and all of that. We're looking for, whenever we're looking at selling products is really just how can we create our own version and then how can we outperform them? So like Chris said, we want to look at their conversion, right? And using a tool like Everbee, we can see their conversion rate. Well, is it a 1%? How can we get ours to a 2%? Are they using all of their images? Are there all their image slots? Um, how is their, their main image? Um, what is their title optimized for? Is yours optimized for that? So I would want to make sure that I'm doing that. Then the other thing that I would do is I would start advertising because in order to be able to directly compete, I need to be visible. And the only way to do that upfront and very quickly is to run Etsy ads. 
So hopefully that helped you there. Uh, let's see here. Can you see and hear me? That's I can hear you. I can't see you, Chris. I'm so going to answer another I have video. Question. I have video on my end. <laughs> yeah. I, can anyone else see Chris? Let's drop that in the comments. Uh, I'm just going to answer this question while we're working on Chris's tech stuff. Um, how quickly can you expect to see results after editing an existing listing? Okay. So here's a couple of things. All right. So if you have an existing listing, make sure before you do a bunch of editing that you realize that when you do edit, especially the title, it is going to get re-indexed. So if you were ranking in the fifth position or on the first page, and you make an edit, it will probably disappear, all right? And then what's gonna happen is gonna get re-indexed. Now, there's no guarantees it's going to go in the same spot. It's There's no guarantees it's gonna go higher. It could go higher, um, but that's why I always tell people, make sure that when you create your listing, you've done this research first. Make sure that you've done your analysis. Make sure that you've gotten it really, really close. Don't just rush and throw something up there because then what's gonna happen is, you're going to want to tweak it a week later. And now you've lost all that time that it's been being indexed. So it could take, you know, it could take a week. It could take a month. It could take three months and it could take you right out of your position. And you're not going to get back to that position. So you want to be careful on when you make these edits. All right. So thanks for that question. Meg's cozy corner. Um, Chris is back. Chris, what the heck happened, dude? So I got a, I got a nice air, man. And as Chris froze again. All right. So Chris was back and now he's frozen again. All right. Let me put him back in the other room until the, okay, here he is. Now he's back again. I'm about to just join on my phone. <laughs> All right. Can, can you share the slides again? Cause I don't have access to those, Chris. Those are disappeared. Yeah. Let me just, uh, let me just re-upload that. All right. So while we're doing that, okay, there you go. You got them. So we'll get back to there. So guys, this is a live stream. That's what, that's what we're talking about here. This is a literal, this is literally live. All right. So we can't even, uh, we can't even, uh, fake this. Um, all right. Um, let me answer. Right, so one this, more. Go for let, it. Uh, yeah. Let, let me just answer one more question. I was on a roll there. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, let's see. Okay. This is a good one. Should I run ads on all my products or select a few? I have 150 products. I would start with a few and I would, again, looking at the demand, right? Looking at what ones have the most demand that you think have the most demand, right? And doing your research using Everbee and all of that stuff, making sure that you focus on those. If I could say out of 150, maybe you focus on 10 and then from there run your ads towards those 10, that would probably be a great place to start. And you're going to get data back pretty quickly. And then you'll be able to adjust and be able to, uh, to tweak some things. All right. So that's what I would say there. All right, Chris, are you back? Are you ready to rock and roll now? Other than I have the sneaking suspicion that as soon as I start, it's going to crash again. I think we're good to go. Uh, so we were talking about making sure that you stand out. That's going to help us improve clicks, which will then help us get a little bit more data, right? If we are star sellers, we're running promotions, all of those kinds of things, then we are going to help increase that conversion rate. In terms of the supporting images, what we need to know is what are the highest converters doing versus what are the lowest converters doing? And we mentioned the one on the right here, the women want me, fish fear me one, this is the top seller in the market but they're not converting very well, which is part of the reason that they are running a ton of ads. So even though they are the best seller, they're not necessarily the best fit at this point in time. And if over time, this listing, which is on the, the left-hand side of the slide, right? The one sitting on the fence post says rip and lips. If this keeps selling at 6% and the other one is continuing to sell at 1%, they're going to take over that market share because Etsy's going to say, this is what people want. Nobody wants women want me, fish, fear me. Everybody wants the rip and lips hat. So they're just going to start pushing that one down and ripping lips up. And if we take a look at the images, we can get a little bit of an understanding of why the one on the left sells better than the one on the right. One, they have all of their image slots filled out. The women want me, fish, fear me one does not. 
Two, they're using video, which helps them get more clicks, but it also gives you a better experience of what the product is, right? If you can't physically hold something, right, you can't walk into Best Buy and play with the new TV and you're just buying it on Amazon, you want to know all of the different things about it, right? Same thing applies here. If you're buying clothing online, you might understand the size that you're getting, but you want to know what the inside of that hat looks like. You want to know what the back of that hat looks like. You want to know what the different parts of the thing are because you can't pick it up, turn it around, look on the inside and do all of those kinds of things. And what we see here is they are showing us some different angles on the left. They're showing us a bunch of different color variations, all of those kinds of things. And on the right, all they're showing us is four or five color variations of this hat. And I don't want to disparage the seller, Scott, but you said something that still has me laughing. You said it looks like they took the pictures in a closet, right? Like there's no lighting. You have no idea what it is. You don't know what the rest of the hat looks like. All you see is the thing that's embroidered on the hat. You don't know what kind of hat it is. You have no idea. You can't compare it to anything else. And you have six variations of colors of a hat that looks like they were taken in a closet, right? Like, is there anything else on the images side of this that really stands out to you as to what, why one listing may be converting at 6% and the other one's converting at one if they're the same price? Yeah, no, I mean... It's crazy because the one on the right, like I would never think that it would even sell as well as it is, right? So that goes to show you like there is room for improvement. So if you were to, if you were going after like a product like this and you saw that, you know, yeah, I mean, this thing is selling, but I can improve it. So we were just talking about that in a question that I was going over, like, how do you compete with a top seller? Well, this is how you compete. You create better images that's going to convert better when you do get traffic. And if you, even if you don't have as much traffic, but you have traffic and you're able to convert it at a better rate, that is going to signal to Etsy that you have a product that converts higher. And like Chris said, if we can show Etsy that we have a product that converts higher, we'll probably get good placement. So yeah, that's what I would say there on that. All right, Chris, uh, moving on. Are you there? And it looks like we might have lost Chris again. All right. So we will go back into questions unless I have do does I let's see here. Do 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 there it is. Okay. So I do have access to the slides. So I might be able to finish this out. It looks like I will. So the bottom line is, guys, let me go ahead and remove Chris out of there. Um, the bottom line is. Having good images is going to increase the conversions. When we increase the conversions, what that will do, obviously, is it will allow us to make more sales. What do sales do? They signal to Etsy that it's a product that people want and they are going to buy. What does that do? It gives us organic placement. Very, very simple. All right. So let's move on here. All right. So the product description. All right. And, and th this is, again, like very, very important because Yes, this can be a conversion aspect, uh, but it's also something that we are able to put into our listing that will get picked up and indexed by Etsy, okay? And so if you look at the one on the right here, I believe this is the one from the top seller, and you can see it. it's very, very generic, uh, any man's perfect cap, cap information, 100% cotton, pigment, dyed, twill, uh, unstructured six panel, low profile. It's basically just what the hat is, right? It's materials. It's like what it is. The one on the left is so much better, right? And it will convert higher. And so again, looking at these side by side, how can we make our, our listing stand out with a best seller or a top seller? This would be a way, right? Is to look and see what they are optimized at. And then how do we make ours better? And this is a great example of, to me, a very, very low converting listing, even though it's a best seller. All right. So um, that's on the product description. And I wouldn't say that the product description isn't something that people read. I think that they do and it can help you convert, but it is also a place Again, remember this, it's a place where you are able to add in information that will get picked up by Etsy and that you could be potentially ranked for because it's now relevant to what you are selling. All right. So moving on, uh, improving the conversion rate. 
So how do we do this? Well, we just talked about it. We're going to go ahead and, you know, do our images. We're going to take our images. We're going to make them better. We're not going to take a bad lit, you know, a, a poorly lit uh, image like that hat. We're going to create ours better, maybe outside. Maybe it's in the environment that it's going to be used. Maybe it's on a person, right? Maybe it would do better. Now that would be a great test. Test the hat by itself or test the hat on a person, right? Maybe that would be a test. So what we want to do is we want to change our images, make sure that it is what the customer is looking for. And it is something that looks professional. Uh, the other thing is we want to add any missing details to our description. So if there's something in there that we can inform them about, whether it is material or whether it is how it's being used or what it's being used for, then yes, we would want to uh, take our description and make it even better. The one thing I would say also, if I go back to the other one here, if you would look at the one on the left, I like it because they did use some emojis and they also broke it up. So it's really, really easy and, and really just easy to read. It's scannable. So I like the listings to be and the descriptions to be very, very scannable. All right. And then the other thing is, is getting the star seller badge. Now I did have a question come in is like, how do you get a seller badge? You have to Basically, you have to go through a 30 day period. I believe it's 30 days that you are and you're and every 30 days you have a chance to get the star seller bad badge. And it does come down to customer uh, service, how off or how quickly you respond. Right. And your feedback. So all of that stuff is taken into consideration for your star seller badge. Now, I will say with the star seller badge, it doesn't necessarily mean that Etsy is going to go, oh, they got a star seller badge. So we're going to rank them higher. Now, it could have a little piece inside of the algorithm, but it's also a conversion mechanism that if someone was to be looking at the different, the different sellers or the different products, and they saw that purple badge with sell, star seller next to it, that could have that customer trust you more and then allow you to convert even higher. So that's something that you could strive to achieve if you haven't already achieved it. So once again, this is what we're talking about. Just to kind of bring it all back together, this is the Etsy SEO flywheel. And I really want you to understand this. And I know some of you have been saying, you know, I'm taking screenshots. Take a screenshot of this, all right? Because once you understand this, it's going to allow you to see exactly what you should be working on and really how it all kind of ties together. So I'm just going to kind of run through this real quick. That's why we started with demand. The demand is number one. We have to know, is there demand for our product? All right. Number two, we want to take that information and take our keywords and make sure that they're in the title. And the most important ones we want in the front of the title. Okay. So that's your keywords. The images, we want to make sure that we add all of our images. We want to make sure that our first image is very, very attractive and very well done. And it's very professional. And then the fourth thing is your description. We want to make sure that that's built out. We want to make sure that it tells more about the product, okay, in detail. And then also making it easy to read, okay? And then your tags, we want to make sure that our tags are relevant to what we're selling. We want to make sure that the keywords that we're going after are also in our tags. And the way to find these tags is to do your research just like you would in the demand section here. And you would use a tool like Everbee to be able to look at your competition to see what they are, uh, what they are ranking for and what keywords they're being optimized for. And then being able to take those and bring them into your listing. And then from there, once we have all that, we need sales. And the way that we get sales in the very beginning is we either wait, okay? And we wait to get indexed. Hopefully we get indexed, but we just went over. We're not going to really get indexed if we don't have any sales. So how do we get sales? Well, we got to kind of, we got to kind of boost it a little bit by running some Etsy ads, or if we have an email list, we can send out an email and do a launch. Uh, if we have social media and it is targeted traffic, we could send it our way and, and boost our sales. And from doing that, we're going to be able to start slowly getting reviews, which is then going to allow us to rank higher in Etsy search. And that is the Etsy SEO flywheel. So those are the components that we need to focus on. All right. And guys, if you have any questions, drop them in the comments and let me know up to this point, before we get into all of the questions, was this helpful? Was this beneficial? And did you get value? All right. And if you did do us a favor and smash the like button, share this if you can and heart it, if you can, whatever you can do on whatever platform you're watching this right now, do that. Give it a little bit of love. We really, really appreciate that. Now, Yes, 
We use Everbee. I talked about Everbee a lot. We are broadcasting right now live on the Everbee YouTube channel. Hey, Everbee channel. Uh, hey, audience. Hey, community. What's up? Uh, we wanted to do something special and we wanted to allow you to use the pro or the growth plan uh, and use it for an entire year and save. All right. And what we're doing here and Everbee has been so kind to do this as well. And they have it where, yes, you're getting a discount when you sign up for the annual plan. But what we're doing is we're giving an exclusive bonus. It's a 90 minute niche validation workshop. Now this validation workshop, we taught to a private class. We don't offer it publicly. We don't even offer it for sale by itself. We are going to be giving this as a bonus for anyone that signs up for the annual plan. So if you want to take us up on that offer, you want to save some money, head on over to brandcreators.com forward slash 90. All right. Just go to brandcreators.com forward slash 90. All right. And uh, you can get full access to that. And I will, before we get into the questions, I will go ahead and throw that up on the screen. So you guys have access to that. If you wanted that exclusive bonus, and if you have any questions on that, drop them in the comments as well. All right. So we are going to answer some questions. It looks like Chris is not anywhere to be found. So we are going to roll on without him for right now. I apologize guys for the little bit of tech issues that we had today. Not sure what happened. But let's go ahead and let's answer some question. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. If we're already signed up for Everbee, if you're already on the annual plan, even if you don't go through that link for me, because basically, guys, I'm an affiliate for Everbee. I've, I've always talked about that. You will buy me a cup of coffee if you go through that link. Um, but I'm going to give you that extra bonus and you'll save some money. Um, but uh, yeah, if you've already signed up for it, but it's not through my link, just message support uh over at everbee and they're in the comments as well uh and we'll go ahead and give you that bonus anyway as long as you're signed up for the annual plan okay just uh, go ahead and send a support ticket to them and just let them know that you were here that you went through this live and that you would like that bonus all right and um and you're on the annual plan all right and uh you'll go ahead and get full access to that all right uh so let's see here Oh, I appreciate that. Uh, Miley says Scott's YouTube channel is also incredible. Helpful. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is a good one too. Uh, so Heinz says also ensure the products are in high demand. Yeah, that's pretty much what we're saying with being in demand for sure. Uh, all right, let's see here. I'm um, just trying to weed through all of these. Uh, let's see. I had some of these starred. Uh, let's see. If you have any questions, guys, drop them in there. Man, there, there are so many. Uh, I'm just trying to scroll through here. There's Chris. Chris is back. Uh, yeah, and I agree. Cody uh, at Everby has done a great job educating all of you so far. So yeah, uh, totally. Cody's awesome. And I appreciate him letting us come on and do a training. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Chris, did you see any questions? I'm glad you're back, by the way. What'd you do? Go have lunch. Uh, <laughs> Streamyard hates me, so I'm I'm running a speed test right now, Scott. I'm 145 down, 145 up. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I had anything to do with that. I think it has to do with the maybe the recording on your local machine. But that we'll talk about. Um, that um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, I let's I started a bunch as we were going through, so I don't know how many of those you made it through. Um. um Okay. Yeah, this is a good one. So Brandon asks, is there a way to do all these angles, these image angles and everything without having the product can't afford samples of all my stuff yet. Plus uh, I'm a minimalist, so I don't want to keep all my product. I totally get it. And yes, you absolutely can. The key is taking your product, putting it in good mock-ups, professional mock-ups, and then using those in Canva to create a good video slideshow or a video that zooms in and then maybe pans over, or then you have another angle of another mock-up, or maybe it's an overview, you know, an over the camera or over the shoulder shot. Any of that stuff you can do and just create a video with it using a good mock-up. Having a mock-up is like having the sample in your own hands. And someone did ask the question earlier too, like, do I have to get uh, all of these samples? Like I have a lot of products. 
do I have to sample all of these? And the answer is no, you don't. It's a good idea to, but if you're using a uh, Printify, let's take for example, and any of the ones that, that allow you to connect with suppliers, a lot of times they're going to have reviews themselves. So I always look at those to make sure that people have been happy with the quality of the products that they're getting. All right. But it is a good idea. If you're going to have something you're going to be selling a lot of, you definitely want to probably get that as a sample. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so did, did you go through the ones that I started? I, I'm trying. Um, I, I, I kind of went through some of them. Um, how quickly can I expect to see results after editing an existing listing? I already talked about that guy. Yeah. I already went through that one. So if you guys missed that when you're joining us late, go on back and listen to that one. Um, okay. This is another one from Meg's cozy corner. How can we find effective keywords in competitive niche digital art prints? Uh, okay. Well, yeah. Digital art prints is going to be very, very broad. Um, you're going to want to go after whatever keywords that, or I'm sorry, whatever products that you're going after, you want to go after that specific one. So the, the more specific that you can get, it's like, um, extra large mom, uh, gardener sweatshirt, right? Like that's a long tail keyword versus you going after just sweatshirt, right? Like digital art prints, pretty, pretty much just broad, right? What kind of digital art print, right? Is someone looking for? So again, thinking about what they are searching for, that's how you can really find those keywords that you're just not a generic keyword. Did you want to say something to that, Chris? Yeah. So digital art is not a niche. Digital art is a type of product. And so yeah. Scott, what you're talking about is making that listing for the niche, right? And that's what you're going to be doing. It's the same thing if we go back and we look at the example of the bass fishing hat, which is it's a bass fishing hat. They're not competing for baseball hat or trucker hat, right? They're not competing for the word hat. What they're competing on is fishing hat. So who is the end user of that product? Who is the person that's going to buy that? And that's then going to be, right? So it'd be gamer digital art, uh, gamer prints, right? Uh, modern home wall decoration, right? Whatever the actual usage of that is. And the person that would type in, hey, I'm buying a gift for a gamer, for a chicken owner, for a whatever, right? That's what they're going to type in. That's what we should be titling and going after. And that's the, the product research portion. The first half of the, the presentation we went through today, that's what we should be looking at. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, 100%. Hey, can you add your uh, slides back? I, they seem to be gone again. Oh, that's a fun feature. Um, I'm going to answer this one. I'd like to know if I can mix terms in one tag, for example, uh, fly fishing hat. I saw this being recommended by someone on YouTube to take advantage of this, uh, of the space. And, uh, let's see here. Um, yeah. So the answer is, yeah, you, you want to be doing that like fly fishing hat versus just fly fishing or fishing hat, like fly fishing hat, um, fly fishing dad hat right? Like, so yes, you are going to be having those different terms. So I'm not quite sure I understand it because, uh, you say, I'd like to know if I can mix terms in one tag. So the terms in this case is fly fishing, right? So anything like fly fishing hat, fly fishing, uh, dad hat, fly fishing. Um, uh, I don't know, fly fishing, um, hat for grandfather, a flat fly fishing, uh, hat gift. Um, Something like that totally would be something that I'd be doing, right? And this is a common misconception by a lot of people. They think they have to be an exact match. The answer is you don't, right? Etsy understands plurals. Etsy understands synonyms. And Etsy understands that there's different variations of this keyword. So if you have fly fishing and hat as two different tags, mm -hmm. yes, you're still considered relevant for fly fishing hat, even if it's not in your title or description, because Etsy found the word fly, the word fishing, and the word hat in your tags and they said, okay, now you are relevant, right? They swiped right, they matched with you and they said, okay, now let's go look at the rest of this. You don't have to have the exact keyword phrase in your listing anywhere to be relevant for it as long as you have the the relevant keywords somewhere. So fly fishing and hat yep. or like synonyms of that, right? So if you didn't have hat, but you had cap, they're probably still gonna show you for hat. Right, yep, no, I love it. Uh, okay. And, uh, let's see here. 
Uh, Chris, do you see a question there that you wanted to address? And guys, while we're doing that real quick, I know that that had went away before uh, because Chris lost the stream again or got kicked out or whatever happened. Um, if you guys are interested in signing up for the annual plan for Everbee, yes, we are a big fan of Everbee. I use it every day. I use it for finding the keywords, finding tags, doing all of that research, looking at the demand. Um, and also I do it for product research and all of the other stuff, right? But uh, if you want to save some money and you want to get the bonus, the bonus that we're offering is our 90-minute validation or niche validation workshop where we actually taught it to a live class privately and we've never offered it outside of our paid training. So if you're interested in getting that bonus, go ahead and uh, head on over to brandcreators.com forward slash 90 and uh, once you sign up there, uh, you will go ahead and automatically get that bonus. All right. We'll send it to you in an email. All right. So, Chris, what you got? Scott, I don't know if you if you covered this one, but this is an important one, right? Which is I'm always hesitant to make updates to existing listings because I'm afraid to mess it up. What are your thoughts about it? How does Etsy handle listing updates? So this is the reason you want to do proper keyword research at the beginning, right? You don't want to be in changing your title all of the time, changing your description, changing your tags. But... If you notice that your description isn't quite as optimized as the people converting higher, it's usually worth it. Will you go through a little bit of a re-indexing? Yeah, <laughs> right? Because Etsy goes, whoa, they changed something. And then they have to kind of test it again to see what your listing quality score is with the new description. But as long as you're making positive changes, and Scott, I know uh, I was here, you just couldn't see me for whatever reason when we were talking about the descriptions, right? Uh, I want to show this really fast. Um, and Chris, we, we did cover this, but I'm just liking your, your version too, because it's very similar to mine, but go ahead. Yeah. So like one of the reasons that you might want to change this description, and I know Scott, you touched on this, but this is something I kind of want to hammer on, right? The one on the right is the top seller in the market. The one on the left is the one that's converting at 6%, right? So the one on the right is converting at 1%. If you came and you saw the, the photos of this hat that were taken in a closet, right? You then go, well, what is the hat? Because all I see is the, the front angle of it. And you go down here. Scott, do you have any idea what 100% cotton pigment dyed twill is? No, no, I don't. What about that. unstructured six panel low profile? I, I know a six panel, but I don't know the unstructured part. The low do profile, you know the I do of, like the low profile. I'm, I'm a fan of the low profile, by the way. What about what about self uh, self fabric sweatband and six sewn eyelids? <laughs> I have no idea. Right. And did you also know that the hat color can vary dramatically from the pictures above, depending on the dye lots, right? <laughs> so like, even if you know what those things are and they are relevant for you, then the very next line says, you might not get the color that you ordered. It might be very different. So that's part of the reason, right? And if we look at the product description on the left, we can see what is this hat? This hat has a fish on with a fish hook design embroidered on a classic baseball cap. I understand what a baseball cap is, right? Uh, on your choice of color. Great. They're not telling me my color is not going to be the one that I picked like they are on the other listing. And I understand they probably ran into issues with that in the past because the one on the right is much more of like a handmade product than the one on the left, just based on what we're seeing. But they're also not telling me anything that I need to know. They're telling me all the nerdy stuff and none of the stuff that I need to know. What I need to know is, is it the stupid snap button closure or is it the metal closure? Because I haven't seen the back, right? Like, is it fitted? No? Okay. So then what's the closure? Because I hate those stupid plastic snappy ones. The, the tabs always break off. I want the buckle closure. This one tells me that I have that. It's 100% cotton. I understand what cotton is. I don't understand what pigment dyed twill is, right? I understand that it has the adjustable closure. And I might, if I'm a hat person, understand what a low profile unstructured hat is, right? And so the one on the left give us all the details that somebody who can't pick it up and touch it would want to know. Scott, you, you know what an eyelet is, right? Mm -hmm. Have you ever bought a hat based on the number of eyelets that it had? No. <laughs> right? Anybody in the chat, please let me know if you've ever bought a hat based on the number of eyelets that it has, right? This is a great example of an under-optimized listing. If your product description looks like the one with the arrow pointing at it, and it doesn't look like the one on the left, it's worth going through that re-indexing process because you're going to increase your conversion rate by telling people what they actually want to know before they buy. And if we can do that, then it's usually worth the re-indexing. Where we want to be really careful is in the title and changing that a lot, 
because as we said at the beginning of this, Etsy does weigh the front portion of the title a little bit more. The title does seem to give more weight to what you are relevant for than the tags in the description. But if we can do proper keyword research up front, we should be able to avoid that. Updating the description is going to have less of an effect because you're still, you still have all the keywords. Theoretically, you're just adding to it, right? So Etsy still sees you as relevant. They then see the conversion rate boost. They're going to give you more love. Images don't really seem to have an effect, which would make sense because images don't really play a role in the first half of that swiping right or left, right? Yes or no from Etsy about whether you're relevant because they don't really understand and they're they're trying to get a better understanding of this, but they, they still don't really understand exactly what's in the photo. And so they're relying on the title, the keywords, the description, the uh, attributes and the category to tell them what the listing is relevant for. So changing the images doesn't get you, at least in my experience, doesn't get you like massively re-indexed, but it will have an effect on the overall conversion rate because you're giving people more of what they want. Yep. Hey, I just want to um, jump in and we're going to answer a few more questions, guys. We'll stay on for about another five to seven minutes. Um, I wanted to answer this one. Are we getting to the upsell, Chris? Are we ready? Are we going to do the upsell? This yeah, is how transparent we are, by the way, guys. I love this. Um, yeah, there is no upsell. You basically, you know, if you want to, if you want to buy ever be great. And if you don't, that's cool too. Um, we're showing up to provide value for the community, ever be rock your brand, all of the Etsy sellers out there. And, uh, if you want to go in, you know, take ever be for a, a tour and try it out, you can do that. Or you can sign up for the annual plan and get the bonus. And there's your upsell. Okay. <laughs> so Scott, here, here's a question. I love it. Can you do this process without ever be? You absolutely can. And and here, here's the thing. And Cody would say the same thing. He built it because he wanted to be able to scratch his own itch. That's what a lot of people do that build a software, a tool. Heck, I've tried, right? I've You and I have partnered with, with someone. We, we built a, a giveaway platform and we ended up running it for a couple of years. And it's a lot of work and it scratched our own itch. Um, but we found out that we don't want to be a software developer. Um, so, uh, you can use it, um, or you can do this process without a tool, but it is going to be really hard and you're not going to get some of the data. Right. But for me, a tool is like, if I was a roofer, I have an op, I have an option. I can use a hammer and just nails and pick them out of my pouch and nail them. Or I can buy a nail gun with about 150 nails that are in a coil with an air compressor and bang out five or six nails within like five seconds. So that's how I look at it. It's a tool that is going to help us save time, but it's also going to give us information that's going to help us improve upon our listings and our products and also do a lot of research to prevent us from putting stuff out there that no one is searching for or no one is buying, right? So that's the big, big thing there. So yes, you can do it um, somewhat. You can't do everything, but yeah, you can go and look at the best seller and go, okay, they're the best seller. They've got 20 in their cart. So it's probably selling, right? I'm probably selling. Now, here's the other thing. Even though it's there's 20 people that have it in their cart, it doesn't always mean that it's selling well. I, I've looked at the data even in Everbee and, and it, you look at a listing, you're going, I think that thing's got to be crushing it. And then you go in there and it's like, it's selling, you know, 20 a month. And you're like, oh, it's not really crushing it. It's just people are putting it in their cart. They might buy it. Eh, I don't want to buy it. So they haven't, they haven't converted. Right. I think the, the biggest thing one, Scott, you, you use the, the roofing nailing analogy, which, you know, you're a construction guy. So that's what, that's what you would use. Right. But like having the tools for the job in general makes that so much easier, right? Like, do you want to spend 12 hours in the afternoon sun putting a roof on, or do you want to spend an hour and a half doing it? That's one thing, right? But here, Everbee is giving you information that you wouldn't otherwise have, right? Yes, we can go and we can do some of the conversion rate optimization by just looking at the listings, right? We can look at the people who are ranking at the top for some of those mm -hmm. keywords, pull up those three to five. We don't need Everbee to do that. Does that make that process faster? Absolutely. But where we're not understanding, Scott, and the mistake you will make if you don't have all of the information is you would assume that the best seller, which is the one that looks like it was photographed in a closet, is also the top converting listing because that's what Etsy says is the best seller, right? So it's clearly the most relevant. It's clearly the best listing here and it's not. And if we don't have a window into that data, 
then you might just go take all the pictures of your hat in a closet and convert it 1%. And then Etsy's never going to put you above that listing converting at 6%. Right. So having that extra data is well more than worth it. Can you do this? Yeah, you can open up all those listings. You can look at the photos. You can understand their descriptions. You can do that. But you're essentially guessing blind in one eye, if that makes sense, because you get to see the publicly available stuff, but you don't get to see the information that, that Everbe has that gets laid over that. And is, is Everbe information 100% accurate 100% of the time? No, but it's pretty darn close, right? And so if it's 5.9% conversion, do we care that Everbe is saying six? No, <laughs> right? Because it's still 5.9 versus one. <laughs> or whatever it is. And we need to understand what the top converting listing is if we want to start that flywheel or set that snowball in motion. And so if you're trying to go through this process and you're trying to do this blind, you know, you can, but you're going to be going at it with half the amount of information that you could have. And to me, I'd rather always have all of the information. That's just me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Miley had brought this up again. Karen asked earlier if commas, et cetera, make a difference in the title. Please, please, please answer that question if you can. Okay, we will. Uh, you know, I, I, I would have answered it, but I kind of missed it, I guess. Um, but yeah, Chris, what's your thoughts on commas, the pipe, you know, the hyphens, like wh whatever in, in the title? Are we going to be not indexed if we put that stuff in there? Or do we have a better advantage if we don't? Put that stuff in there or if we do put that stuff in there i wrote uh like a three or four paragraph response to this question in the everbee facebook group which if you guys haven't joined you should check that out there's a lot of people talking about some really cool etsy stuff in there every single day um but based on all of the documentation etsy does not care about pipes commas slashes colons semicolons tildes whatever right they're going to ignore that because it's not a keyword right that's what they're that's what they're looking for yeah However, and this is one of the two biggest howevers of the day, right? We're not writing for the algorithm. We're writing for human beings. And so if we just write fishing hat, bass fishing hat, whatever, yes, we're going to get indexed for that, but it's going to be impossible for someone to read. Adding yeah. in columns or pipes, which if you guys don't know what a pipe is, it's just that black vertical line, right? Slashes, any of those kinds of things. If it makes the title easier to read, then include it. Why? Because an easier to read title means the human beings who are searching through this are going to have a better understanding of what it is that you sell, which means they're more likely to click on it. So it's not a direct effect, but there is a downstream effect to not using those things. Yeah. Uh, here's another one. I like this. Um, is it bad to serve multiple niches in the same store? Okay. Bad is kind of harsh. Um, do people do it? Yes. I would say more people do that than don't do it. Um, but I personally don't like that. And the reason why, and we've talked about this before, the reason why is because I like to think of the Etsy shop is a storefront. It's a brick and mortar store that we have. And I want it to be very, very specific on who my customer is going to be served or I'm going to be serving my customer with certain products. It also allows me to think of it more as a business, right? So if I was in, which I was in the window and door business, right? So if I'm in the window and door business and someone calls me for a roof, I'm not going to try to sell them a roof because I just want to sell them a roof because they came to me. I'm going to say, I don't do roofs. These guys do. They're friends of mine. Go check them out. Right. And I want someone to come in that, that wants windows that wants also maybe doors. Maybe they want like windows in their screen porch and then maybe they want them in an addition and then maybe, they, but I'm only serving that market. And when they come in, they know they're going to get stuff for what they're looking for. So I just think it's easier as a business and also for a customer to come in and leave with buying more and feeling as though they came into a shop that was dedicated to that particular niche. Okay. And as far as business goes and guys, we've been doing this for a long time. Whenever we're looking at building a business, it's always like audience. Okay. Who are we going after? What products are they buying? And can we create those types of products? And can we get people to come back and buy more? End of story, right? If you have a, if you have a shop with multiple niches, someone walks in and go, Oh wow, they sell fishing stuff. Oh, they sell knitting stuff. Oh, they, it's kind of like, you're like that gas station at the, on the side of the road that you go in and they just sell a little bit of everything, right? That's not what we want to be for us. Does it work? There's some people out there doing it, 
we just prefer not to because we can do so much more within the brand and outside of Etsy later, we can do more, right? Um, so we can get into that another time, but uh, that's my short, semi-long answer. Your medium answer. So Miley on Disney said, Etsy seems to pick and choose words to fit them together. That's exactly what they do, right? They're not looking at a phrase and saying, okay, they put a comma after bass fishing hat. So that's a complete right. fright, right? They're not, they, they could not care less about the structure of the English language. What they're looking at is the data that you give them. And if they don't break it down into all of the individual words that you are including, they're not doing their job. And so that's one thing, Scott, everybody tries to repeat, right? So they put fishing hat in the title and then they put bass fishing hat. And then all you're doing is wasting space at that point because Etsy already knows that you're relevant for fishing hat. Remember, the top seller for fishing hat does not have the word fishing or the word hat in their title, right? It does not exist. And they're still relevant, but it was in their tags, right? And so if you're finding yourself, especially in your title, repeating your keyword that you're trying to rank for multiple times, consider rewriting your title to something that's more English readable. Because what Etsy's gonna do is they're gonna take a look at all the individual words in your tags, all the individual words in your description, and all the individual words in your title. And they're gonna say, what are all the plurals and synonyms of these? And what are all the combinations? And that's what you then get said yes to for when somebody is searching. Any combination, any plural, most common misspellings, right? Any of those kinds of things. Once they're in the title, tags, or description of your listing, you are relevant for all of those phrases. It's just a question of how relevant, which is where the second half of their algorithm comes in. Yeah. This question isn't really uh, SEO uh, related, but I wanted to answer it for Janet. Um, I need to know how to list my offer of personalized items for various different products. I cannot list all that I can do in one listing. Um, then I wouldn't. I'd keep it simple. Uh, I think sometimes uh, people want to cram as much as they can into one listing. I would actually prefer it to be less, right? And the reason why is it makes your life easier and it makes the customer's uh, life easier. It, it, there's less choices, right? That's why I like Etsy ads. There's less choices. There's less knobs to turn. There's less, you know, switches to to you know push up and down or click up and down. Like there, there's there's less. So to me, my advice would be create those personalized listings, but just create create multiple ones of them. That's what I would do. I see I see something here that is SEO related. And there's an, another variation of this question that I want to touch on. Somebody was asking about multi-language listings. But to okay. me, this is SEO related. And the reason that this is SEO related is because it's conversion rate related. And you and I have talked about this in the past. But in terms of whether you should put the same, you know, four variations on the same listing or create four different listings, that's kind of how I'm viewing this, right? And so if we have a dancing avocado mug that comes in four colors, that should be one listing because Etsy doesn't care if it's red, green, or blue. The buyer doesn't care if it's red, green, or blue. They're going to see the color drop down, just like we saw in those hats that we were just looking at. However, if there's a singing avocado mug, dancing avocado mug, uh, picnicking avocado mug, that's a weird verb, um, you know, <laughs> soccer ball kicking avocado mug, right? Those should be different listings. Why? Because if I click on the thumbnail image of a dancing avocado and I get to your listing and I start seeing that it's a soccer playing avocado, that's a weird thing for me. I'm going to bounce back. The color is not a, a, an issue there, but the, the action that's happening to the avocado would be something that's different. And so we, we also want to be relevant for soccer playing avocado, all of those kinds of things. If you're trying to shove all of that into one listing, it is not only not human readable, but it's also under optimized for conversion rate. Why is conversion rate important? That is a huge signal to Etsy for their Etsy rank algorithm, right? The listing quality score portion of this that we talked about, that if they drive somebody to your listing, do they buy? Do they add it to the cart? Do they favorite it? Or do they just bounce back and go to the next dancing avocado mug that doesn't have the soccer playing avocado mug and all of the other fluff thrown in there just because we wanted to create one listing instead of two or three. So if it's a variation of the same thing, so it's a color, that's fine. If it's a different design or totally different style, maybe even a totally different fabric or material, create it as a different listing, right? So Scott, if you were going to buy a, an all metal water bottle and you got in and there were four variations and in the drop down, right? It says in the title, like metal water bottle, metal, metal water bottle. Uh, and you got in there and there was metal, plastic, whatever, you're going to be confused by that. And so those should be different listings. Yeah. If it's all just variations of this, you know, it comes in stainless steel and black, stainless steel and blue, stainless steel and orange, then yeah, just create it one listing and yeah. have that as a color variation. Yep. 
Uh, this question here, Kimberly Jones, what's the best way to use Etsy ads for beginner and how much should we spend? Okay. I'm going to give you this, uh, right now, Chris and I did another live on the rock your brand channel, uh, maybe two weeks ago. And, uh, I actually pulled it up and Chris, I don't know if I can link that up in the, in the comments, but if not, just go to the YouTube channel after this. And it's uh, titled how to make Etsy ads work in 2023 and are they worth it? And we went through basically a full strategy on how to use them, how much to spend and all of that stuff. But I would say starting out with spending, start at two bucks a day. Just start, just start, you know what I mean? Like two bucks a day, start getting some data in. And then from there, you know, go crazy and spend $5 a day, you know, and then you're, you know, then you can get more data, right. And possibly more sales. Um, I, and I would say too, you want to start small and kind of work up and also try to limit the amount that you are advertising and going back to what we talked about earlier, your demand, what products have the most potential for demand, the most search, um, right now, those are the ones that I would focus on. So check out that though. Chris and I did a full live on that. We broke everything down. So that's on the uh, rock your brand channel as well. Yeah. I want right, to drop a couple extra that live. Oh, you, you dropped it in the comments. Yep. Cool. It's in the comments. guys. Uh, so one, one variation on the, the last one that we were talking about, about variations is multiple language listings. And should you create different listings for different languages? The answer is no, I would create one because then you have all of the search traffic, all of the factors coming from one and you don't have to worry about it. If you do speak multiple languages, you live outside of the US marketplace and let's say you live in Canada. I know we had a lot of people from Canada coming in. You're gonna have French and English, right? Etsy will automatically translate your listing, but there's a really cool little thing, again, buried in all of their SEO documentation that says manual translations get higher placement than automated translations. So mm -hmm. if you live in Canada or you live in Europe and you're going to have German speakers, French speakers, English speakers, whatever, even if you go to Google Translate and translate the listing, right? You're not a native German speaker um, or you're not a native French speaker. You're still actually going to get more benefit out of copying and pasting the Google Translate translated listing into the manual translation than you would out of just letting Etsy translate it. So if, if you do live in a multiple language market, do the manual translations rather than just letting Etsy translate it. But I would keep multiple languages for a listing on the same listing and Etsy will just serve it based on the user preferred language. So you don't have to create two different listings. And in fact, you're probably better off creating one because you keep all of the, the sales and uh, ranking factors on that one listing rather than spreading it out over two or, or three. Okay, cool. A couple more questions and then we're going to wrap it up here, guys. We've been going on here for about an hour and 40 minutes as of right now, which has been awesome. A little bit of a tech issue there, but we're good. We're good. We figured it out. Uh, but uh, just did want to remind you guys, if you did want to take advantage of the uh, the Everbee bonus and the savings, you can head on over to, where is it now? Right there. You can head on over to brandcreators.com for says 90 and you'll get a 90 minute uh, private training that we did for one of our classes and, uh, you will get access to that. It's our niche validation workshop, which will also help you with, if you're trying to figure out demand for, uh, your niche and for your product. So it'll definitely help with that. And you'll get the savings for the annual plan. So head on over to brandcreators.com forward slash 90. Also do me a quick favor and, uh, or as the kids say, do me a solid and, um, would you, uh, <laughs> Chris, I knew you'd like that. <laughs> I knew you'd like that. Um, somebody yeah, please do, start dropping old man speaks young yeah, kid. Yeah, guys, would you guys do me a solid and, uh, just smash that like button and, uh, you know, leave us a comment. What was one of the biggest takeaways from today's training? We would really appreciate that and, and share this with anyone and anywhere that you think that people would get value from it that are obviously selling on Etsy. We'd really Really appreciate that. Um, I did have one here I wanted to answer. I think it's a good one. Um, John had said, um, thinking about going into the wedding or couple store or only a bride store. So I'm planning to make a bride and husband store. It's basically the same as a wedding store. And the reason why they said this was like someone had said like, well, I think you have to pick one because wedding in general is kind of broad and it's very competitive. And it is. I actually did a video um, that talked about how to really go after these bigger niches and if you should. And just to kind of give you a summarized version of that, 
yeah, you, you totally can. And I'm a big fan of going after a market that gets a lot of traffic and a lot of sales, but doing exactly what John said here, going after one segment or niching down or niching several levels down. So that way there, you're still in that niche, but you can eventually start either leveling up or going wider in that niche. And, and we shared an example on a, I don't know if it was on a live or a video in the past where uh, someone had created stuff for bridal parties. Uh, and I mean like the women in the bridal party and doing like a bachelorette party. And they made all of these t-shirts that each one said something a little bit different about that person's personality. Right. And they're doing great. But now they are in that market. They can, they, they're now attracting people that are in the wedding industry. And now from there, they can start to add other products and they're totally relevant. Etsy likes it. They know that they're a store about wedding stuff. And um, yeah. And so that's what I would say for anyone that's like, should I go into the baby niche? Well, you can. I wouldn't go just after the baby niche. I'd try to find an angle and try to go narrower where it still has demand, but then also allows you to grow within that full, you know, that full size niche. Anything you want to say on that, Chris? No, I think it, it really comes down to understanding which niche you want to serve. You can enter any niche. There's no such thing as a niche that's too competitive. It's just how far you want to niche down or how far you need to niche up to hit your number. Scott, there, there was a good one uh, that came in from Ryan who said, how do I fix my broken Etsy algorithm or say to reset? So the question would be, what do you mean by broken, right? Are you not getting any impressions? Are you not getting any clicks? This is the backwards engineering that we then have to do, right? If we have a listing, we can then start to look at the data. And how old is the listing? Is it a week old? Have we driven any traffic to it? If not, we're going to get a handful of impressions, right? But mm -hmm. our first job is to see, are we getting impressions? If not, then we need to fix that. The easiest way to fix that is with Etsy ads. If we are getting impressions, but we're not getting clicks, right? We're not getting views on the listing. Then we need to fix that. What is the reason behind that? Well, let's take a look at where we're getting impressions, the keywords we're getting impressions from. Take a look at the top ranked products there. What are the photos that they are using? How is their title structured? What is their pricing like? Are they star sellers? Are they running promotions, right? What are the, the extra pieces of flair to, to quote one of uh, my favorite movies, right? What are the extra pieces of flair that they have on their listings um, that will help people know that that's a listing that they should click on? Are they using videos? Are we not, right? What are the reasons that people are clicking on other people's listings and not ours? That's what we have to figure out. If the issue then is, okay, we're getting views, but not sales. That's when we need to look at, again, the photos, the product description, some of those kinds of things to figure out where the problem is and why people prefer someone else's product to ours. If the algorithm is broken, the algorithm isn't broken. The listing is broken. There's something wrong with the listing. And Etsy's saying it's either not a match, right? Or it's a match, but no one wants to buy it. And if no one wants to buy it, they're going to stop showing you. And it's going to feel like everything is broken and that they're out to get you. But our job as the seller is to go back in and figure out why Etsy thinks that no one wants to buy our thing and then change that. Yep. Uh, Dragon Hoss had said, careful how you niche down your brand uh, or how, how niche down it is because your shop name, if your shop name is John's Brides and your branch out, the name might be too niched. True. And I do like that you brought that up. That's why I'm always about like more broad. Like, so if I was going to go into sports or I'm sorry, uh, bass fishing or something along those lines, I wouldn't call it, you know, bass fishing. I would call it more something outdoorsy, right? So it allows me to talk about other things, but it's still somewhat related. And you can always adjust that. You can always change your name too, by the way. Um, but you can take that little tagline there that goes below your name. Uh, and you can kind of describe what you are, who you are serving. And that can always change as well. But I'm so glad that you brought that up, Dragon Hoss. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, Let's see. Do, 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 do. I had another one here, Chris, that I wanted to answer, and it was a pretty quick one. Um, and also, Miley uh, had said Etsy ads are great for seeing which search terms are working and which ones are not. And I agree. I think that is exactly right. Janet asks, could we put links to other products in the description? And the answer is absolutely 125%. Yes, you can. And you should. Right. If there's something related to that, put it in there. Right. The other thing you can do in your images is let people know that you have other things that go well with the other thing, right? So you can do that too. Um, I don't know how well actually, it works. 
but you could do it. One, one of the examples that we shared, the one that's converting at 6%, they link to another listing yep. to say, add this to your cart. If you want us to embroider something on the back, we have a custom embroidery thing, but I can't put it on this listing. So go here, add this to your cart if you want that. And they link over to it. As long as you're not putting them to your site, right? Like as long as we're keeping them within Etsy, Etsy's going to be cool with it. Now, can that negatively affect where that listing ranks? Yes, because people are leaving that without buying. But the question is, you know, in the case of like that hat, right? They're adding both things to the cart. They want the hat and they want the embroidery. So that it doesn't really affect it. But if you're saying, hey, uh, you know, go over here. If this is what you want, go to this totally different listing. It will theoretically impact the, the first listing because you're losing people on the conversion rate. Now, the question then becomes how many of those people are there and does Etsy really care because they're still buying from you? Right, all of those kinds of things. But just keep that in the back of your head. If you're linking from one listing to another, you can potentially affect that first listing because they're not giving Etsy the behavior that they want to see when they drive traffic to that listing. They're saying, hey, this is actually the solution to my problem. So maybe you should show that one next time instead. Yeah, and uh, Janet had said they are complimentary products themed. Perfect. Um, and let's see here. Oh, and uh, Dragon Hoss comes back in and says, true, um, you can change it, but rebranding isn't a fun task if you got all your domains and social setups. Yes, okay. So I just, I do want to just kind of speak to this. We're talking just on the Etsy side. If you're going outside of Etsy, that's when we really need to make sure like, is this the, the name that we're going to stick with? Is this the right thing? 100%. Once you create your own website, once you start maybe doing some social media, some blog content, like any of that stuff, YouTube channel, like whatever. Yes. You are going to have to make sure that you are happy with that. And I would not want to change it at that point. So you're 100% right. So thanks for bringing that up as well. All right, Chris. Um, we have any quick little questions we want to answer here that we can get to before we officially sign off here. Uh, Christine said, what was the title of the YouTube training you did on Etsy ads? So if you go to the, uh, just search bar on YouTube, type in brand creators, go to the channel. Just click on the lives. Uh, it's right there. But uh, it was called something like making Etsy ads work in 2023, something like that. It was three or four lives ago at this point. Um, it's Scott, uh, yeah, it's titled it's titled How to Make Etsy Ads Work in 2023. Are they worth it? And yes, it's in the live tab. So um, if you go there or just search for it there and you'll find it. And uh, Chris and I did a full deep dive there. It's a full live training on that as well. Uh, somebody had asked, can you link multiple Etsy accounts to one Etsy app? I believe you can only be logged into one account at a time because each, each Etsy shop, even if it has the same tax identification, right? Yep. So Etsy knows that you're linked on the back end, needs to be tied to different login credentials. Makes sense, right? So you'd have to log out and log in. Um, if anybody has a workaround for that, let me know. But I haven't seen anybody uh, that's been able to do that successfully. And the question would be, right, what's the easier way of doing that? And it would be having, you know, one browser that you use for one shop and one that you use for the other rather than even using the app. But if there's something you wanted to manage mobily, like replying to customer messages or something like that, you would have to log out and back in. But they also let you log in with Google. So if you use a Gmail address or whatever and you're already logged in on your phone, it's as simple as just clicking the log in with your other account button and it takes all of 10 seconds to switch between shops. Awesome. All right, guys, that is going to officially wrap up this training. But I did want to say this right here okay this tool yes we are an affiliate for them because we believe in them we use them every single day um cody has been amazing to myself and chris and really allowing us to serve the everby audience whether it's on facebook whether it's on youtube now um on the channel so i want to thank cody and uh, and everyone on the team uh, for allowing us to do this and everyone in the community um for for really just allowing us to help you and serve you in one way or another. And what we want to do is extend this offer to anyone that is serious about their Etsy business, wants to get this data, wants to be able to use it to better leverage uh, your own listings and really be able to see what's working. Um, so this is where it speeds up that process and also eliminates you wasting time. So this here is a special ever be bonus that we are putting together. You'll get the four months free. So you'll save 120 bucks um, by signing up for the annual plan. And you'll also get our 90 minute niche validation workshop, which also talks about finding demand, really an analyzing demand and understanding how it works for products and for a niche. Um, so we're going to give that 
um, as a free bonus when you do go through our link at brandcreators.com forward slash 90. All right. So guys, that is it. That is going to wrap it up. I want to thank you guys so, so much for hanging out with us. We really enjoyed hanging out with you and we will most likely be back. Let us know in the comments. Should we come back here on the Everbee channel? You guys want us to come back? Let us know. And uh, the Everbee team will be uh, watching as well. So let us know if you want us to come back and do another training for you um, in the near future. All right, guys. So take care, take action. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye guys.